There we go. Just had to get situated. Thanks, everybody. Um, as uh, Elizabeth mentioned, I'm an urban community forester with the Nebraska Forest Service. Unlike Terry, I only have 40 some counties to cover on the eastern half of the state. Um, and up until July 1st, I've been doing all of that from Douglas Sarpy County. So um, ju just this afternoon, um, I went out to Euling, Nebraska. They had some suspect ash trees in their park that we took, took a look at. Didn't find anything overly suspicious as far as EAB goes, but it was absolutely wonderful to uh, get out and get some fresh rural Nebraska air, uh, meet somebody new in a town that I haven't done a lot of work in before. So um, as Elizabeth mentioned, I'm gonna try to move quickly, mostly because I have a lot of slides and I wanna respect everybody's time and get lots of Q&A in. Uh, I, I titled this talk, The Slow Green Tsunami, mostly because I see EAB as maybe not quite as predictable as a tsunami, but if you can imagine the meteorological data coming in showing that a tsunami is, is imminent, uh, we, we've known for a while that EAB is eventually going to make its way here without being able to look into a crystal ball to tell exactly when. So for a while as an agency, we felt like we were crying wolf. People started to get tired of hearing about EAB without any fines. And uh, so, so I see this emerald ash borer as sort of like a tsunami with this uh, predictability to it, um, but still a lot of devastation uh, that will occur regardless. So we'll get right into it. And Elizabeth, if you're getting a number of questions in the chat and you wanna stop, just give me a cue and we'll, we'll certainly do that. Uh, so for starters, um, this is just kind of a fun photo. Um, I was distributing some Tree City USA materials to our city contacts and uh, took a look at some ash trees on Ash Street in Ashland. So I got a triple whammy there. It's just an awesome picture for, for a presentation like this. So nothing particular to say about these trees. They're looking pretty decent. Of course, I'm gonna check them for any signs of EAB. Uh, infestation and didn't find any there either, but uh, it's kind of a fun picture to take. So just kind of an overview of what we're going to cover. We'll, we'll talk about the history of the, the find, uh, the history of the beetle uh, here in the United States, get into the biology and the life cycle of, of the beetle, discuss what the implications are for communities and homeowners as well. Glad to take these uh, questions as they relate to individual property owners, as well as the larger municipal or, or land managers. We'll talk about tree removal, uh, managing wood waste, quarantine considerations, and then finally we'll talk a little bit about treatments uh, in as much as it um, had there's information that's relevant to, to those of you, um, you know, in, in deciding what sort of treatment you might want to consider for your tree. So a couple quick facts to start off with. Uh, EAB was first found in the United States in 2002. It's killed millions of trees since then. This is an Asian beetle that's made its way from um, northeastern China, as we'll see later. Um, all of our native species of ash are susceptible to this pest. Uh, they have not co-evolved alongside the beetle, so our trees in North America uh, don't have the same sort of defense mechanisms that develop over millennia of coexisting. Um, EAB does kill trees regardless of health condition or size. Um, most wood boring insects have a role in the forest as sort of the cleanup crew. They have a way of sensing stress in trees and they infest trees that are already sort of compromised. But that's not so much the case once we have a beetle from another country make its way over here and have a whole host of species that it's never uh, had access to before. Um, it's usually uh, you know four to six or seven year window from the start of the infestation that the trees usually die. Um, the financial losses will certainly be in the billions of dollars for the United States. And uh, there are treatments that, that can be employed um, every year or every other year, as we'll talk about with the products uh, to protect your tree, if that's uh, something that, that seems to make the most sense for you. So as I mentioned, EAB is a Asian beetle. It's found in uh, Mongolia, the Korean Peninsula, Japan, and Northeastern China. It's uh, believed that it made its way to the US in packing material or pallet wood of some sort. 
It was initially discovered in southeastern Michigan, where there's obviously the Great Lakes, a lot of trade coming in and out of there, shipping containers, things of that nature. And I don't know if there was any ever any detective work that got us to the bottom of exactly what sort of uh, products it came with or if it was pallet wood. Uh, we have a pretty good sense that that's most likely how the beetle made its way in a, in a dormant or immature state here and then emerged uh, as, as an adult uh, to begin infesting our, our um, country. So that was in 2002 that it was originally found. Um, some of our, some of my colleagues in extension trained in entomology could probably speak to how long it was likely in Michigan, but this was a beetle that wasn't on anybody's radar until it was discovered. Uh, now that we're all more educated about it and on the lookout, we can usually find it within about four or five years of it being in a community, but we're always kind of behind the eight ball and we'll talk about why that is. These are really popular photos that were shared from Ohio where EAB has um, maybe not run the course, but it's definitely in, infested a number of cities and we've seen the impacts. Uh, this is what the same street looks like three years after infestation was, was uh, detected in the community. So you can see how all these trees being removed will really denude a neighborhood that, that put all its eggs in a couple baskets or even just one basket almost in, this, in the case of this photo. Very dramatic impacts when we don't heed the warnings from Dutch elm disease to bring diversity into our urban forests. So this is a uh, 2012 photo of um, detections in, um, in counties that, that uh, the yellow counties were uh, detected prior to 2012. The red counties are new uh, for that particular year. As we move into 2020, we can see how many more yellow counties we have and the handful of red counties that have been added to Nebraska this year, uh, Buffalo County and Seward County being uh, the two new ones. And just kind of a close up of the of the region. Uh, we were we did have a find in South Dakota as well that was new um, and one new county in Colorado uh, on the front range. Or I guess that's probably past the front range into the Rockies a bit. Um, we found EAB in 2016 in Pulaski Park. Uh, without getting into too much detail for the sake of time, uh, we found it at a press conference related to EAB, which was pretty ironic. Um, the city had brought a high reach to take some branches out of stressed trees in the park where we were doing, making an announcement about EAB funding being allocated additional to uh, the forestry budget for the city. Um, so of course, we had to sort of keep things under wraps from the press. There's a protocol that we have to observe when uh, EAB is being located and confirmed in a new state. And so um, that was uh, a bit of a challenge to have this beetle sort of fall in our lap in a press event. And uh, we all had to sort of maintain our composure as we were seeing symptoms that were just telling us that we were probably on the verge of that confirmation. Um, so, um, just a couple photos of some of the bark scraping we were doing at that time. Uh, again, I want to move on from the, the story about the find in Omaha so we can keep things moving. This is the uh, initial 2016 quarantine map uh, showing the counties that were initially quarantined as a contiguous group. Uh, there's too much industry that moves between these counties. so. Um, Department of Ag felt it was more prudent and uh, feasible for them to cast a larger net in that initial quarantine. The orange circles are showing you the 15 mile radius from the actual fines uh, that would give the area that we definitely consider, uh, ask you to consider treatments for trees um, if that's something that you wanna do. That Greenwood find that you see uh, down off of Highway 6 with you in the center of the second orange bubble, uh, that brought part of Lancaster County into that 15 mile um, radius, even though there wasn't a find in, in Lincoln for another couple years. Uh, so this is our, our state quarantine map as we see it today. This shows you the fines that are in place. Um, the, the quarantine isn't quite accurate because I believe 
It has been extended around Seward County as well. And again, maybe uh, Kate or Jody could uh, speak to that in the chat to confirm if that's the case. Um, state and federal agencies uh, put resources into monitoring for EAB so we can try to get a sense of where it might be popping up next. Some of you that are um, in state parks or city parks a lot might have seen these purple traps. Um, there are also visual surveys that are, that are done. Uh, in Nebraska Forest Service, our forest health department has a program called Tree Pest Detectors where we offer training to local citizens to survey for pests and in exchange for that training, they commit to um, a handful of hours monitoring for uh, two or three different pests they've been trained on in the, in the communities that they live in. And then of course, the front line is really the arborists that are out doing this work day to day. It's typically a tree that's very far in decline, if not dead, that we find EAB in, in a community initially. As I mentioned, it's usually trees are fairly asymptomatic the first couple of years. Um, there's a handful of correlations here with, uh, with COVID-19 actually and, and the problematic nature of people being asymptomatic and the same is true in trees where um, an infestation will, will be a couple of years old before we start to actually see the signs of decline in those trees and start to look a little bit more closely. So back to my comment at the very beginning, we're always behind the eight ball. We're also always chasing a pest that's been in an area for a little while before we find it. It's predominantly people that are moving this pest around. Uh, here in Nebraska, we don't have large swaths of contiguous ash forest that would connect one community to another for the pest to move through. Uh, so it's usually infested firewood logs that, that um, are moving this pest from one community to the next. And that does add an element of unpredictability to it where we don't know who's moving firewood. Quarantines are designed to control and monitor that, uh, but they get more and more difficult to monitor. Um, you know, people can move firewood uh, without even necessarily knowing that there are laws in place against it. So in, in, in firewood where we actually have the immature larvae being moved as it feeds and goes through its life stages and its life cycle, and then emerging as an adult from that log somewhere else. Um, adult B EAB beetles have been found alive, just smushed up underneath the windshield wiper blades. Um, an RV or a, a, a family could stop at a rest stop that has infested trees. Beetles can make their way into the, the cab of the car and just sort of hitch a ride further down the way. So when we're monitoring for EAB in new locations, it's often campgrounds and high traffic areas that we look to to find uh, emerald ash borer. So people like to be sure that they're going to have firewood to burn when they're at campgrounds. And so it, it's understandable where the thought process comes from. Um, so we're always trying to educate to be sure that the public is aware of the challenges and the problems that can come from moving that wood with you. There are a number of ad campaigns, burn it where you buy it. Um, you know, it, it, Emerald Ash Borer is a really complicated topic to condense down to a bumper sticker. Um, it, it, it does a good job of begging the question and gives a website that you can uh, go to to get more information. Um, but at any time myself, I'm sure my extension colleagues uh, share this uh, frustration of n often not getting enough um, space in the newspaper or time in an interview to go through all the specifics on that. So um, all the more reason for me to really keep things moving and try to get as much information to you guys here as I can with the time that I've got. So as far as the biology and the, and the life cycle of the pest, um, we have a number of agrillus species that are native to North America. The bronze birch borer, as the name implies, is a beetle that's predominantly infesting birch trees. Uh, this is the little bugger that makes us not very able to widely plant European birch. Again, same sort of problem we have with emerald ash borer where EAB is a native pest infesting native trees to North America. In this case, we have a native pest in bronze birch borer that uh, is particularly hard on non-native birch species that we want to put in our landscape. And same with the two-line chestnut borer. Um, these are, this is another species of agrillus that goes after different trees. 
So one silver lining of agrilis is that they are fairly picky eaters. They like to stick to a family of trees and they're fairly selective that way rather than some other forest pests that are uh, not as picky and can infest larger portions of the urban forest. So some of our trees that are particularly susceptible are, are green ash, particularly the Marshall seedless and Patmore cultivars that are uh, sold a lot in the nursery, as well as the autumn purple cultivar of white ash. Uh, but in North America, we also have black, blue, velvet, pumpkin ash, and a handful of others that aren't really uh, native or adapted to uh, the Great Plains, but are native to North America and will be uh, similarly impacted. The beetle does sort of have its preference on which species of ash it really uh, tends to prefer, although it does eventually get around to all of them. So green ash tends to be um, more aggressively infested. Maybe there's a better way of, of phrasing that. I don't want to give too much credence to the idea that all the green ash are going to die before the white and then the blue. It's not, certainly not that cut and dry, uh, but they do seem to have their preferences amongst the species of ash. Oftentimes you get questions about whether or not this is sort of like a tsunami, a wave that will just come through and then be gone after it's, it's done its damage. The challenge is that Fraxinus uh, species tend to sprout from the stumps. When we, when we see the whole top of a tree die, it's, it's normal to assume that the tree is dead. Uh, but in the case of ash, sort of like other trees like mulberry or tree of heaven, the, the root system is still alive and intact and not infested by the beetle. And so the stump sprouts, as well as the lingering ash, meaning individual trees that have some genetics that make them a little bit more uh, uh, tolerant of being infested or resistant to it by just a twist of fate, means that there will always be some habitat for the beetle, even if pressure might, might go down after most of are susceptible uh, trees are taken out of a particular community. There are a handful of trees that we refer to as ash that are not actually genetic relatives of Fraxinus. So mountain ash is a sorbus species. There are a couple species. Uh, these are more widely planted in the western, more arid part of the state. We can get away with mountain ash here in the east, but it doesn't seem to, to perform very well in most contexts. So it's not a real popular tree here in the Missouri River corridor so much, but definitely one that you see in different parts of Nebraska. This is not, it, although it's called mountain ash, it's not susceptible to EAB. And also there are a handful of Telia species, wafer ash, hop tree. Uh, these are also referred to, they have ash in their name, but they're not genetic relatives of the trees that we're concerned about. Now, Fraxinus is in the, in the olive family. And there are some other plants that uh, we can look to as potential infestation points for, for EAB. One that we know for a fact is fringe tree. This is marginally hardy in most of the state, so it's mostly southeast Nebraska that you might find fringe tree in the landscape. Although it is more of a like a large shrub, small tree, and uh, EAB does prefer to have larger woody parts in a plant uh, that they choose to infest. But EAB has been found in fringe tree. A handful of other landscape plants that we do have in Nebraska in the olive family that we haven't seen EAB in to this point uh, are lilac, forsythia, and privet. So these are all plants that we don't have any confirmation of EAB actually infesting, but they do have that potential just by being uh, genetic, uh, I don't know if cousins is even the right word, but they're in that same sort of genetic family of trees and, and shrubs. The basic life cycle is not all that different than a lot of other insects. Adults will lay eggs, in this case, in the bark crevices of the tree. As those hatch, they become a small sort of, I know grub isn't the correct term, but um, worm or grub looking uh, like larvae, and they will tunnel into the tree and continue to feed on the vascular tissue of the tree as they go through a number of life cycles in their pupation. And then finally, they emerge as a new shiny green adult we'll talk about some of the timing of that a little bit. 
D-shaped exit holes are, are one of the signs that uh, the adults leave behind as they emerge. It's distinct from other uh, borers of ash trees, although the bronze birch borer and the, and the two-line chestnut borer uh, both have sort of similar exit holes. You just would be seeing those on different trees. So if, we're, if we know we're looking at an ash tree and we see distinct D-shaped holes, that's fairly indicative of EAB. One of the challenges though is that ash trees have very corky bark and often this D-shape is not gonna be very distinct in trees or it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna come out at an angle and make it a little bit difficult to see. The other challenge of using exit holes as an identification feature is that by the time you can see these exit holes from the ground low on the trunk, you're gonna have a tree that's stone dead or in rapid decline because the infestation tends to start up in the canopy of the tree and move its way down. So here's some, some photos of the, those adults emerging from the tree showing how their, their top or backside sort of gives that flat D shape to their exit holes. The arrow and the, and the twisting icon there is, is showing that, um, you know, reminding that EAB adults can emerge in a number of orientations. They're not always going to be straight up and down. Sometimes they'll come out of the tree upside down or sideways. And so that D could be oriented a number of different directions. Um, adults tend to emerge in this part of the country around Mother's Day. Um, when we look at, at uh, from an entomological perspective, we, we consider degree days as a way of tracking when emergence of different insects is likely to occur. And so 450 to 500 degree days is when adult emergence happens. This is typically, if you want to look at the phenology of it and, and correlate this timing with other uh, plant activity, black locust trees, which can be found throughout most of the state, are usually going to be in bloom at the same time that EAB adults are emerging from trees. So as the adults emerge in, in mid-May, their primary focus at this point is to spend a couple weeks feeding and mating, of course. And so this is part of why they like to be in the top part of the canopy in the early stages of infestation. They want to be up where, where the ladies and the guys can see them and they can find a mate and, as well as feed on the leaves. So the adult beetles are more of a minor stress factor in and of themselves. It's really their larval stage that's tunneling through the live tissue in, in the branches in the trunk that caused the vast majority of the damage to the tree. It's good to keep in mind that with, within, with most insects, aside from EAB, foliage feeding is something that we have to have a threshold of tolerance for. We have to allow trees to be part of the ecosystem and a food source for uh, different organisms that share the, the uh, the environment with us. So with EAB, you can look for this foliage feeding in trees, but again, you're probably gonna be a climbing arborist uh, noting this if it's not a tree that's in severe decline because it's gonna be high up rather than particularly visible from the ground. So a female uh, beetle will lay 50 to 90 eggs, like I said, in the crevices of the bark and those eggs will hatch and, and begin to uh, form into that larvae that, that uh, tunnels into the trunk or the branch. So tapeworm is another word, I guess, that you could use to describe what they look like. They have a very distinct bell-shaped segment that you can see here in these photos and uh, four different stages uh, here where they uh, go through sort of a, a physiological change and growth. While, the, while these galleries or tunnels in, in the bark look fairly chaotic and random. There is sort of a pattern to them. They, uh, in the early stages of infesting a tree, they'll make a very distinct sort of switchback pattern. Well, they'll, they'll go one direction, make a 180 degree turn, and back and forth they go. Uh, as the tree continues to be infested with more and more beetles, the natural defenses of the tree are compromised further and the galleries get more sporadic and, and less um, ordered. But as, as the, the note down below here says, they're feeding in the phloem and the outer xylem of the tree. And this is sort of the veins of the tree, if you want to think about it that, that way. This is the live tissue 
that's right under the bark that's moving moisture and nutrients from the ground up to the tree. And then uh, in the case of the xylem, moving the energy that's made by the top of the tree into the woody parts for storage. This is why the, the beetle is particularly devastating uh, to ash trees because they they rarely tunnel into the heartwood. They, they stay feeding right in that live tissue that's so critical to biological processes. So other symptoms we look for is this sparse foliage, the tree starting to decline, typically whole branches at a time will go before others. It's not a real uniform decline. Sometimes there will be yellowing depending on when that infestation is taking place as well. As the feeding gets worse and worse, the tree is having a harder time moving that energy that is stored up to the parts of the canopy that it wants to keep alive. And so then the tree will start to manifest sprouts lower on the trunk in order to make use of that energy where it can get it to in the, in the, in the uh, branches. And so this is another strong sign of a tree that's been infested for a while and is in you know, rapid decline from EAV. In forest settings, natural resource managers will often look for the blonde bark stripping that, that birds will um, pull off of the tree in order to get to larvae. I'm still amazed at how a bird can intuit that there is a meal uh, underneath a half inch of wood and get to work starting to pull pieces of the bark away to get better access at that food source. So that, that sort of blonde look that you see to where the bark stripping occurs is another feature that people will use when they're cruising uh, timber uh, to look for where EAB might be occurring. And here's the galleries I mentioned before. If we look at the picture on the left, the larvae initially started at the top of this gallery because it was a much smaller insect and it starts to tunnel to the left as a, as a small insect. It's chewing on that foliage or the, the, uh, the wood and um, it's casting frass and excrement behind into the tunnel as it goes. As it moves in a straight line to the left, eventually the tree starts to produce compounds that resist that, that activity and make the wood less tasty and palatable to the beetle. Uh, and so it makes a U-turn and it goes back into wood that is still um, easier to digest and, and more attractive to it. And so it goes back and forth. The, the larvae continues to get larger and the gallery gets larger. It's able to go longer to one side or the other before it has to make a U-turn. And eventually, as you can see there in the bottom, we have a pretty, uh, pretty fat, juicy uh, larvae ready to pupate and turn into an adult. And as I mentioned earlier, in the center picture, the, the galleries get much less distinct and uh, more chaotic looking as the tree succumbs and continues to decline. Um, the, there's, uh, there, there's been some observations in northern states that EAB will actually take a cue from the really cold temperatures in states like Minnesota and Wisconsin and will actually extend its life cycle over two years. And as they're, as they're in the tree in a trunk or branch doing their life cycle growth, they'll actually move into the heartwood to protect themselves from those colder temperatures. And I don't know if a dormant state is accurate, but they, but they slow down their, their, their growth in order to make that happen over a longer period of time. In warmer states, this is typically just a single year life cycle. Uh, but it is kind of an interesting bit of trivia that they have uh, ways that they can take cues from the climate and extend that life cycle for a longer period. Pretty interesting how nature finds a way. So here's where we're transitioning from larva into a pupal state, uh, much more uh, maybe comparable to a butterfly in its cocoon sort of going through a more um, a more dramatic change that will occur as it comes out as an adult beetle. And here, here's a, an excellent side-by-side -side showing how that uh, progression occurs. Really attractive beetle for all other things being said. It's, it's, it's a really pretty bug. Uh, so that pupation takes two to four weeks and now we're back to 
the beginning of the life cycle again, we're back to mid-May where that egg that was, was laid last year is now an adult emerging in the tree the following growing season. So we have a number of other borers that can be found in ash trees that are native here. And they are much more of that cleanup crew role that I mentioned before. They're only gonna be infesting ash trees that are already in decline or stressed some way. Emerald ash borers certainly are happy to infest stressed trees, but, they don't, but they're not picky that way because they're so effective at infesting trees that still have their defense mechanisms at full bore. So just because we're seeing holes in ash trees doesn't mean we have EAB. It's important to remember that we do have other native uh, species of uh, tree pest that also infest ash trees. And here's sort of how those larval stages and adult stages look different for different examples. The galleries are also different. As I said before, EAB is going to stay right beneath the bark in that vascular tissue whereas the other wood boring insects are going to do much more uh, tunneling through the heartwood as well as uh, the xylem and phloem. The exit holes for our native borers are typically larger, more kind of pencil eraser size, whereas the EAB exit holes usually have that D shape that you can observe and are about half the size. It's also worth noting that just because you see holes for native borers doesn't mean that you don't have EAB in the tree as well. Um, there's no rule uh, saying that you only have one type of borer in a tree at, at, at a time. So um, when I'm monitoring a tree that might be infested with EAB and I see larger borer holes, that doesn't mean my work's done. It's still important to check the whole tree out for signs of those smaller D-shaped holes that EAB would leave. So there's a great example of where you have, um, you know, two different exit holes on the same tree. So some of the other borers of ash, these are ones you might be familiar with already. If, if you already manage trees or you're a um, um, tree healthcare practitioner uh, doing uh, treatments and sprays for trees, flathead apple tree borer, red-headed ash borer, carpenter worm, privet borer. Uh, these are all different uh, boring insects that you might have in your tree other than EAB. Elizabeth has a number of web links that might either be already in the chat or they'll go in there in a little bit. Um, and our NFS EAB page has a number of publications that are just fantastic for not only covering the different factors, but doing it breaking it out into different topics as well. And so that's a great resource to turn to for more detail than I'm gonna give you today. There are some other adult insects that often get uh, reported as somebody finding EAB. The uh, dogbane beetle, tiger beetle, you can read the, the slides. There, there's a number here that are shiny and green I'm sure, my, again, my extension colleagues have had some calls like this, and it's, and it's perfectly fine to call in uh, an insect that doesn't turn out to be a EAB. Don't feel like you don't, you're not gonna call or bring something to someone's attention because you wanna feel foolish. It's much, much better that we get lots of those calls and have a vigilant public that's out looking for this rather than uh, being too worried about whether you're, you're correct or not. Um, a lot of green beetles out there. So um, yeah, just reach out to Extension, Nebraska Department of Agriculture, US or Nebraska Forest Service, get a hold of one of those agencies and let us know if you see something suspicious, either trees that are exhibiting these symptoms or uh, insects that you think might be emerald ash borer. Uh, here's some, some phone numbers. Again, we can make these available to everybody that's registered after the fact. There'll be the recording, so you can always go back to the recording and find these phone numbers, but I'd just like to put them in the PowerPoint as well. So to transition over to talking about what this means for a community, obviously there are a lot of benefits for trees. I could spend a whole hour talking about why trees are awesome. Uh, and, and so just to summarize, 
some of the things, some of the eco services that trees provide, so, uh, you know, improving air quality, take, uh, infiltrating, uh, you know, allowing stormwater to take up into the tree and, and transpire back into the atmosphere, you know, driving that water cycle, uh, reducing noise, providing habitat for all the critters and insects and birds that are, live in cities as well. Uh, trees have been proven to improve property value in, in homes that where uh, that's desirable. They obviously provide a sense of place and psychological well-being. I mean, trees actually fight crime, guys. We, we, we have research that shows that uh, extensive urban canopy improves the walkability of a neighborhood. And that walkability means that there's more eyeballs on the streets and certain types of opportunistic crime that are suppressed by just the, by virtue of people being out, in, uh, out and about in the neighborhood more frequently. We also know that people that even just can see green space and trees from a hospital room actually use less pain medication and uh, are discharged from the hospital faster for the same uh, injury or reason as somebody else without that same green view. So any one benefit of trees is hard to justify why we, we find them so important, but there's just dozens and dozens of reasons why trees are so vital to have in your community and we should be proactively managing them. Trees actually improve business districts and we have plenty of Nebraska towns with main streets that are uh, struggling and in decline for one reason or another. And if you, if you have canopy in those districts, then you do well to preserve it and maintain it. And if you don't, you could look into ways that you might be able to incorporate it back into main streets in uh, smaller, you know, communities of all size, really. But it's been found that people spend 12% more time and money in these districts when they have tree canopy uh, in those areas. People like to park under shade. People like to sit under shade, um, have a coffee with a friend. You know, there's a lot, th this, this just improves the overall desirability of the business spaces that drive the, the viability and the success of our Nebraska communities. So where, where do you want to shop, right? There, just to give, you know, a, a, a contrast between a canopied and uncanopied commercial district. Also in the links that I provided is one to the National Tree Benefit Calculator. You can log on to that website and punch in what type of tree you have, how big it is, and it will tell you exactly how much benefit it's providing uh, to you in, in a number of different ways. So it is worth mentioning that benefits like stormwater, uh, th these are only benefits in as much as their actual tax costs in the first place. Uh, Omaha is the only city that I know of that actually treats uh, stormwater in the sewers before it gets discharged again. So when we're talking about stormwater savings from a tree, what we're doing is we're quantifying the amount of water that doesn't make it into the sewer system that then has to have tax dollars spent on it to clean it. So if you're in a community that doesn't treat stormwater, then that stormwater benefit isn't realized. Uh, but most of these others are, are pretty uh, cut and dry in terms of electricity savings from casting shade, uh, cooling homes, minimizing uh, air conditioning use, things like that, property values. So it's an interesting tool to look at if you're curious about what sort of services tr your trees on your property might be providing. And, that's, and that calculator is uh, on an individual tree basis rather than plugging in data about a whole lot of trees at once. Um, there are lots of intangible, be intangible benefits of trees that, you know, the beauty, the sense of place, just the sense of belonging and wanting to be in and around trees. As a species, we evolved from the African savanna where trees were an indicator of a water source. They were a way to escape from predators. They also gave us a, a vast view of, of the area around. And sometimes if they were food producing of some sort, then they were a meal as well. So it's, it's, it's my belief that it's just really ingrained in us as people to want to be, have trees around. Even though we can open the water tap and get water when we need it, we can turn on the air conditioning and cool our homes. We don't necessarily need trees for all these benefits the way we, we used to throughout our evolutionary history. Uh, there, there's still that, that underlying psychological draw to, to tree canopy that's intangible. 
So some numbers, we have about 8 billion ash trees by estimates that are worth you know, billions of dollars if we were to consider their replacement costs and these same sort of ecosystem services I mentioned. Uh, when we look at ash trees in cities themselves, we have a, a smaller estimate of about $60 billion value. In Nebraska, we have over 50 million ash trees in woodlands and rural areas, and about a million trees in our communities throughout the state. We have some communities where one out of every five trees in that town is an ash tree. So with all these benefits that we've, that we've covered, uh, having a beetle come in and threaten 20% of the urban forest in a community is a pretty significant factor that needs to be planned for. I mentioned Dutch elm disease earlier. Just a quick aside, Dutch elm disease was actually the precursor for urban for and community forestry as a profession itself. Before Dutch elm disease, foresters were predominantly men in wide brimmed hats in towers that were looking for fire. They were managing trees as a, as a resource, you know, hectares and, and square miles of, of uh, forested resource. But once Dutch elm disease started to come through and take away all these elms that we had lined our city streets with, we needed a different skill set to bring education to people on how to navigate an, an insect or disease problem that's threatening a large portion of the urban forest. So, you know, it's kind of a rhetorical question. Did we learn our lesson about Dutch elm disease and stop lining our streets with a single species of tree? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. There isn't a single answer to that. It's very much on a block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood, community by community, uh, answer to that question. But we can revisit the same photo I showed uh, earlier of a community, you know, here in the 21st century that had city blocks lined with a single species of tree. And there, you know, there are reasons why a community would want to do this, even though it's uh, bad practice from a forest health standpoint, it does simplify the management strategy of the city that needs to come prune these trees. All these trees that are on this street here, they're all the same species, so they ex exhibit a similar growth rate, a similar structure. They have a visual uniformity to them that's not in place when we have lots of diversity. And so there's ways we can balance diversity and management practices uh, on that municipal level. The ash death curve is really showing cumulative mortality over time. So this would be a, a, a normal distribution bell curve if we were just looking at yearly mortality, but if we're cumulatively looking at the percentage of the ash in a community that have died over time. Uh, year one, where we have the first beetle and the first ash tree in a community, we're gonna have absolutely no mortality because it's gonna take time for the population to build and actually kill that first tree usually somewhere between year four and seven. Um, as the population grows, uh, mortality is gonna spike. And so years seven to 12 is really where we see the vast majority of a community's ash trees dying, even though we're talking about a 15 year curve. And, and this 15 years isn't written in stone either. There's plenty of Great Lakes states like Ohio and Michigan and Wisconsin where, and uh, Minnesota where EAB continues to infest a community uh, in, to a significant degree, and, and there's still ash population left 15 years later. This is just sort of a, a generalization about how the process occurs in the community. So by year 15, you're getting, you're getting into that 90% mortality. Um, the point is that even though we, we look at 15 years on this graph, it's really about a five to seven year window where things really get crazy and a lot of trees are dying. This just puts a finer point on why it's so important to prepare and um, um, start the work before you've even necessarily found EAB. Because it's pretty much um, a, a sure thing that, that EAB will make its way through the state. It's more a question of when it will be in your community than whether it will ever make it there. Although there are some that hold on to a notion that there are communities isolated enough that could take quite a bit of time before it's confirmed there. And that's, that's possible. 
So th these are just some general numbers for a community like Fremont. A lot, lots of us have visited Fremont. It's, it's not so large that it's um, unrelatable. We have plenty of communities of this size. Fremont, uh, last time we did a, a inventory in 2012, had a little under 800 ash trees in its public spaces. So again, these are not numbers for all the trees that are on private property, uh, but this just gives some rough numbers. If we assume a $1,000 cost to remove and replace an ash tree, this is based on a 20 to 24 inch tree. So we're making assumptions about the size of the tree, the cost of the removal and the cost of replanting, just to get a rough ballpark for costs. Then when we're at the peak of that infestation in a community like Fremont in year 11, we're looking at 179 ash trees dying in that year. Now that is a lot of trees, but it's also worth noting that this is above and beyond the typical year to year mortality that a community deals with anyways. So this is not the total number of trees dead in Fremont. This is additional ash trees, aside from all the other trees that might be coming and going in any given year in that community. So the question becomes whether $180,000 in actual tree work, in ex extra tree work in, a, in one year is doable for a community of the size of Fremont. And so by starting now and preparing and starting as a com at the community level, starting to take out those ash trees that are in poor or even fair condition, knowing that they're gonna be infested at some point and, and die first when, once the infestation is there, you can start to spread this out. And again, we're getting back into a concept that we talk a lot about with COVID-19, with flattening the curve. Instead of this 179 in year 11, we'd like to see uh, more trees being removed proactively earlier on uh, so that that peak isn't so high and we have that mortality spread out more uniformly amongst the years. So if we, if we add up all of the costs over these years, we're looking at, you know, under a million dollars, uh, you know, to take care of all the dead ash trees that might be, um, be impacted by EAB in a community the size of Fremont. Again, the, these are, aside from the inventory data itself, these are all fuzzy numbers. They're not meant to be, you know, definite predictions of any sort just kind of gives us an idea of the scale of the impacts that we'll expect in a community of that size. So just some more examples of some of how this plays out in different parts of the country. Another reason that EAB is really important to manage and stay on top of is that the we get a particular type of rot in the tree called sapwood rot when they're infested with EAB. As I've mentioned a couple times, they're only in the vascular tissue right under the bark, and that predisposes the tree to get particularly brittle and unpredictable if it's left standing dead for a long period of time. So this has two implications. The first one is that um, we, we can't be complacent in removing trees that are in a, a severe state of decline because of that unpredictability of them falling on homes and cars uh, once they are infested and uh, pretty much circling the drain at that point. The other implication here is that your tree services in your area, if they're smart and they're good arborists, they will not climb these trees if they're left to, to decline this much. And then you're left with a tree that even the tree services that uh, know what they're doing are gonna stay completely away from and will not even give you a bid on the removal for without the involvement of a big piece of equipment like a crane uh, to make that job done really safely and not put the lives of, of a tree climber at stake because the tree is too far gone and unpredictable. So here's an example, Maywood, Illinois. Uh, this was a green ash that was infested with EAB, a 32 inch tree. It was one of these sort of fuzzy cases where it's in the, in the public right of way, but also kind of on, on village property for the neighborhood association. Uh, one, of, one of the two main leads in the tree split out of the tree, killed two people when it fell, and uh, the city of Maywood had to settle for over $3 million in that case. 
So now that th that three million dollar settlement, aside from taking two of its citizens tragically, is also added to the cost of EAB's impact to the community as well. We hate to reduce people's lives to dollars, um, but there but the courts will be happy to do that for us, and then we have additional costs that we can associate directly with the EAB. Another consideration for communities is how you're going to manage this wood. Infested wood is going to be under quarantines and, and restrictions about where it can be moved to. And so particularly large communities are going to need to find a staging area for infested ash wood to be placed so that it, you're not continuing to spread uh, the pest to other areas and, and keeping it locally um, contained. One uh, sort of silver lining, I guess, with EAB is that it does not infest uh, the heartwood very well. And so we can put the, the wood from ash to a lot of use. This is a public library in Am Ann Arbor, Michigan. The, the desks that you see, the architectural elements in the windows and, and the steam vent um, laminate, that's all from, from beetle killed ash trees. Uh, they really embraced using uh, wood from infested trees in a big way. And so uh, we, we can at least uh, put the wood from these trees to good use because the beetle is not tunneling through the heartwood and, and making it difficult to put it to good use. So when we're talking about quarantines, um, you know, this is not my area of expertise. The uh, Department of Ag is the regulatory agency really controlling all this. Um, but all life stages of the insect itself are, are, are uh, restricted from being moved across county lines or outside of a uh, quarantine area. Uh, all, all, all ash nursery stock is restricted from being moved. Um, ash limbs, branches, logs, all the parts that, that come down as a tree is removed are, are quarantined and regulated. And uh, firewood from all hardwood species are regulated as well. So this doesn't mean firewood from just ash um, because oftentimes hardwood, firewood is uh, lumped together and it's not a single species and it becomes very challenging to regulate it uh, when it's mixed up. So they cast that wide net of all hardwood, firewood uh, being contained uh, from being moved across quarantine lines. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and any other article present uh, presenting a risk of spreading EAB um, so that's sort of, a, again, sort of a miscellaneous category. Um, firewood producers can receive a compliance agreement uh, if they go through the paperwork and, and have some inspections periodically uh, of their business practices. And so there are ways that firewood producers can get the okay to move their product after it's been inspected periodically. And this, um, Logo that you see down below is what you might look for in firewood at your gas station or hardware store or wherever you, or wherever you might buy it to check for whether it's, un, it's wood that's been uh, inspected and is under a business that has a compliance agreement. Hardwood chips and mulch are, uh, they can be made uh, able to be moved through the, these lines. Uh, hardwood chips have to be no more than an inch in two dimensions. So if you can get under an inch wide, under an inch deep, and three feet long, uh, that would be okay, as long as two out of those three dimensions are less than an inch. Uh, so calibrating a tub grinder or chipper accordingly would make that uh, chip material able to be uh, compliant. There are no certificate certificates being given for nurseries to move ash, uh, live nursery stock, um, they shouldn't be selling ash trees anyways. And so uh, there aren't any exceptions being given at this time for that. Although just like with Dutch elm disease, the industry does have elm trees that are tolerant or resistant to Dutch elm disease that, that are on uh, back in the nursery trade. And so at some point we would expect the nursery industry to have uh, EAB hybrid or uh, ash species hybrids or trees that have been selected for resistance that can be plant, uh, sold and planted again at a later date but for the time being, uh, it you know, takes the industry decades for that process to occur. Again, just throwing phone numbers out as we're talking about it for the appropriate agency to, to reach out to. So ideally, if you have trees that you know are infested with EAB, we wanna be 
uh, taking care of those before that mid-May time window that, that we discussed, um, just in the effort of, again, minimizing the likelihood of that adult emergence and chipping those trees with all the little buggers inside. Now treatments, I'm, I'm going to graze over really quick, partially because we're already about an hour in and I want to get plenty of time for Q&A. Um, so I'm just going to go over kind of the, the specifics about treatments that you as a homeowner want to be aware of as you're talking to an arborist about uh, options for treatments on your trees. Um, again, that 15 mile radius is from a known infestation is the net that we cast for when you should consider treatments if that's something that you want to do with your trees. For most statements or states, they use that same 15 miles. Michigan said 10 to 15 miles. Colorado says five miles. New York has different tiers based on how extensive the infestation is known to be in a, in a given area. So it's not uniform from state to state, but pretty, pretty similar practices. So when you're deciding whether or not to treat trees, um, as we've mentioned, EAB is a very aggressive killer. It, it does kill trees that are perfectly healthy otherwise in ways that other wood boring insects don't. Uh, it is difficult to detect EAB early on, which makes people want to be more proactive with those treatments, and there is some validity to that. If you have trees that are really valuable, either because they're casting a lot of shade on the house and giving a lot of those sort of environmental benefits, or maybe it's a tree that you planted with a loved one, somebody that's not with you anymore, or has some other sort of sentimental value. Those are other reasons that people uh, choose to elect the, the treatments rather than removing and replacing uh, sooner. There are some drawbacks to treatments as well. You have to continue to do this in your tree as long as the tree is alive. This is basically life support. It's not a vaccine, a one-time shot. Depending on the treatments, it's going to be done every year or every other year. So by choosing to treat a tree, what you're saying is that you, you want to spend the money to keep that tree longer, and you're going to spend more money later to remove a larger tree that you allowed to continue to live. So there are additional costs associated, not just with the treatments, but with the cost that you're going to pay to eventually remove that tree because it is a living organism that's going to die at some point. And what you're doing is allowing it to continue to grow and uh, be more expensive to remove down the road. Some of the treatments also damage the tree. We are drilling into the tree and putting that product directly into that same vascular tissue that the insect feeds on and it's distributed by the tree throughout the whole canopy. And so that does have some impacts. There are other treatments that are not put directly into the tree where we're dumping product on the ground or injecting it into the soil or spraying it on the bark to be translocated into the tree. And those have secondary impacts to the ecosystem and other organisms that are in and around the tree. Of course, human exposure is all, always a concern and making sure that people are using uh, proper um, personal protective equipment and practices when they're applying these things and the, co the cost issue that I mentioned a bit ago. So just hitting the point again that EAB will always be here in some capacity, even though the pressure and the amount of, of, of population in an area will change over time as that mortality uh, curve comes and goes. Uh, we are not ever gonna get rid of EAB once it's in a community. So um, there are a handful of, of trunk injections with different active ingredients. It's not important that you're aware of these different uh, trade names and, and, and chemical names, um, other than knowing that some of them, uh, the emamectin benzoate, uh, and again, my entomological colleagues fact check me along the way, uh, but emamectin benzoate is, is the one that, that's typically sold and, and effectively uh, applied every other year, and a lot of people elect to use uh, because of that, that cost savings and efficiency, as well as the uh, less physical damage that occurs to the tree by not in, having to inject it every single year. And those other two treatments are going to be applied more regularly as a trunk injection. The thing I like about trunk injections is the damage is shouldered by the tree and the, the uh, pesticide exposure is limited to the extent of the tree itself 
and uh, the pollen that it produces. With soil applications, we have a uncontrolled dose. We don't know exactly how much the tree is taking up. We're dumping it on the ground where it can be taken up by other plants. It can be, it, we're also exposing other organisms in the soil and on the ground to that, that product. Uh, bark sprays, same basic uh, challenges with environmental impacts. I don't think the, the bark sprays are really taking hold and being used as extensively in, in the industry. I just don't hear as much about them, even though there's some research showing some degree of efficacy. Residual bark sprays and foliage sprays, you know, foliage sprays are really only controlling adults, which are laying eggs and making the problem worse. Uh, but it's really the larvae that we want to control because that's the damaging life stage uh, that the beetle takes on. And we can interrupt the life cycle by killing larvae just like we can with eggs or with uh, adults and uh, be more effective by targeting the larvae that are inside the tree rather than the adults that are feeding. The other challenge that I'll mention about the soil applications is that these are, these are only on label for smaller trees. So last I checked, most of those soil products were labeled for trees up to 12 or 15 inch. So if you have an ash tree that's 12 or 15 inches, it's a pretty young tree to be committing to treating for the rest of its life. You're probably better off considering planting your plan B tree, getting some years of growth out of it and pl planning on having that ash tree come out at some point. If, tr if ash trees are particularly young or particularly old, they're not suitable candidates for treatments or they're, you're gonna be committing to a whole lot of cost and time that you're, um, you're treating that tree if it's really young. So that's another factor. Um, I do want to disclose here that these next slides are pictures of a completely different injection system than what is used for EAB. So this is just demonstrating the physiological changes that occur in, in a tree in response to drilling into the, the wood. As you see here, what's going on is we're drilling a hole to give us access to um, the live tissue that's under the bark, that this, this sap wood that's usually somewhere between two to six or seven rings worth of wood that are functionally moving that nutrition through the tree. Um, these injections were done without any product. So the impacts that you're seeing in these slides are all just from the drilling itself, not from any damage that occurs from the actual product that goes into the tree. So over time, as, as these injections build up, we've severely impacted a large amount of the tree's intact wood and exposed it to the potential for decay to spread into the stem of the tree and cause a different problem than what we were trying to, to solve in the first place. So as these injection sites continue to be needed over time, you can't inject the same site that you did last year, so you have to drill a new hole. And this, this damage does spread vertically up and down uh, the, the trunk as well. It's important to use this Titanic analogy when we're thinking about why this is important. With a submarine or a boat, you've seen the movies. Um, when we get a hole in the boat, what do they do? You seal, you close up the hatches, seal those off, and make do with some portion of the of the boat flooding while the rest stays uh, dry. And a tree is doing the same sort of thing with the way it's it's got wood divided into compartments. And so the more we break those compartments, we're drilling holes in the ship that allow water, in this case, the analogy to water is decay organisms, to spread into the interior of the tree. And so there's always that possibility when we're causing physical wounds to the tree that there are gonna be these other side effects. Um, you know, again, more, just some, some more photos of how these products are applied. Uh, it's worth, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Ash is a wind pollinated tree, so it's not visited by a large number of pollinators, but there is always the potential that pollinators will visit the flowers of ash and translocate uh, that insecticide and ingest it in the pollen that, that's manifested from the tree as that insecticide is in, injected into it. So we, we can see secondary impacts to pollinator um, populations from injecting ash trees. In the case of some of the soil applied products, if we have other trees that are not wind pollinated and actually insect pollinated more aggressively, 
those trees could be taking up the product from a soil application and causing more severe problems that we have seen in the news about widespread impacts to bee populations and things like that. Um, so I got a little bit ahead of myself there. Ash is wind pollinated. So it's not a really important plant for pollinating insects, uh, but they will visit any plant that has pollen in it to take advantage of what's there. The other plants that you have in and around your trees can, can take up this product if you're not injecting it directly into the trunk as well. And so those, you know, the rhododendrons we see down below, the hostas, the pollen that's on the flowers from these plants will have that insecticide present in it if we're applying a product to the soil or something instead of that, that direct injection. And finally, on, on environmental impacts, it's worth noting that if you have, a, all these active ingredients have a per acre rate that's regulated by the EPA. And so if, you're, if you have a single acre of property and you have three trees that you want to inject that are these sizes, 20, 20, and 24 inch, then by injecting those three trees, you have reached the threshold of imidacloprid that could be applied to that single acre of land. Now, when we look at cities where most people don't have a full acre of land, it's anybody's guess at what point we've reached and potentially exceeded that threshold of how much active ingredient is really safe for the environmental impacts that it poses on that single acre that's multiple or that's occupied by multiple homeowners. I mentioned some of our publications in the past. Here's some examples of those. Community readiness planning. Um, inventories are a really powerful management tool. You have to know where your ash trees are how big they are, where they are, and what condition they're in so that you can plan for making a strategy to flatten the curve and mitigate the workload that's posed by this beetle once it makes it here. And then get to work on taking out those marginally, uh, those trees of, of questionable condition now, even if you don't have a confirmation yet in your community. Diversity, diversity, diversity. I think it's pretty obvious why that's so important as we go through this. Uh, public awareness is also important. Uh, Fairbury has a park south of town, over 200 ash trees lining the, the road to the park. They've done a great job of going through and starting to take those out and replace them. And they're learning their, their, uh, their lesson on monoculture in a public space. And that public outreach is really important. So everybody in the, in the community knows what's going on. So consider treatments for the high value trees, the trees that are maybe of historic importance, uh, and, and on a community level, these injections are also a curve flattening uh, tool to mitigate the workload and slow down the mortality, not uh, often to keep them alive uh, forever. So I, I, I hope I didn't go too long, a little over an hour. Uh, there's some contact information, again, repeating those phone numbers and email address for me. That phone number isn't super useful right now because I'm still officing out of home. So email is still best if you want to reach out to me directly. Thanks, guys. OK, Graham, we had a few questions in the chat pod. One was really early on. And uh, excuse me if you asked it, and I'm paraphrasing. Um, we had somebody that was a homeowner that was interested in working on being like a uh, citizen scientist to be yeah. looking for EAB symptoms. Yeah, that's that tree pest detector um, training that, that we do. Um, I'm gonna reach out to Lori and David. I know that they're planning some more of that in the future. And so I'll get some information rounded up that you can send out to all the registrants as well. So anybody that wants to tap into that program and get that training uh, can do so. So I'll make a note here to uh, round that up and we'll, I'm guessing Elizabeth will probably do kind of an email blast after the fact so we can get all that information in there. Yep, we'll do an email blast with the recording and the handouts as well as the links to all those as well. Um, we kind of hit them quick and fast and so some of those. Mm -hmm. um, Ron Seymour asked, how effective do you expect the biological control efforts would be? Wow, uh, yeah, so there have been a handful of parasite, uh, parasitoids, other insects that, that like to go after EAB in one life stage or another and sort of prey on them. 
Um, this is going to be effective at, at keeping populations a little bit lower than they would be otherwise. But you can but in order to have a significant population of these parasitoids, you have to have a significant population of EAB for them to be preying on. So it's sort of like that analogy of rabbits and wolves in the forest, right? Um, you have a couple wolves and there's not a lot of pressure on the rabbits. And so the rabbit population builds. And then there's a lot of food source for the wolves, right? And so the wolf population grows in accordance with the rabbit population growing. And then the wolf population starts to really knock back the rabbit population and they're really interdependent on each other. So uh, it's, it's never gonna wipe out EAB because the, the population of those parasitoids are gonna decline as EAB does. And then its effectiveness diminishes accordingly. Um, I, I, again, uh, Jody or Caitlin might be able to give some more up-to-date information on what's been found so far on that. I'm scrolling through the comments, so go okay. ahead, Jody. I don't have any updates about the parasitoids, but um, around uh, parks in Omaha, we'll see the little um, pieces of wood tied around ash trees. So they're, they have released some, but basically it's not for, I guess, our lifetime, it's for future trees. And so that, that makes it a little bit sad, but I mean, they're working on biological control for the future. Yeah. So Barry asked about other tree species recommending to replace ash. We did put the link to the Forest Service um, trees to plant as well as trees for Eastern Nebraska and trees for Western Nebraska in the chat pod. I think what Barry's getting at is maybe which ones are your favorite uh, um, yeah. that we need to be planting. Uh huh. We need to be throwing the kitchen sink at this thing and, and not picking even four or five or six trees that we're, that we're planting behind this mortality. So again, in, in the notion of diversity, um, it's hard to throw out recommendations when Nebraska is such a, a, um, a, a diverse state for in, in terms of growing conditions, uh, average rainfall, uh, what trees are good choices for different parts of the state. And that's why we have so many tree lists available. Uh, and so that's another thing that again, we'll, we'll throw into that, that email blast uh, links to a variety of different tree lists. Um, but it, this is also a good opportunity to consider mature size, right? In some cases, ash trees have been planted in places where a smaller tree is much more preferable because of power lines or something like that. So uh, we, it's another silver lining in terms of this mortality being an opportunity to address that right plant, right place situation and get a tree that's got a mature size. It's not gonna be in conflict with a building or a utility of some sort, and we can make really good choices. So uh, Barry, you're, you're on the right track wondering what, what to plant next. Uh, and my answer is, uh, what's good in Grand Island? We, let, let's, let's really uh, cast our net wide and to a small degree, try a handful of species that we don't know much about yet. Tulip tree, you know, um, uh, that that wafer ash, you know, again, is one that it's got ash in the name, but it's not susceptible to EAB. And it's also a tree that doesn't have other species on another continent that might have a pest that could come in and devastate it. So uh, maybe five to 10% of the trees we put back in the for in the community forest should be things we're trying and trialing a little bit. And then, you know, the vast majority of those trees should be the tried and true ones that we know grow well and we can depend on to become solid canopy down the road. So I that's kind of, a kind of a politician's answer that it depends and there's a lot of answers, but uh, it's, it, it's really the truth. Well, and Barry, I know has done a good job trialing different trees in the city yeah. of Grand Island. And there's some that are doing extremely well in a low maintenance area. So, you know, like Graham said, don't be afraid to try something a little different in a spot and see how it does. Especially, um, on the, especially on the homeowner level where you only maybe have room for a tree or two and uh, that, that's where you could stick your neck out a little bit and give something a try that maybe we don't know a lot about yet and tulip tree is one of those or, or pecan where um, you know pecan grows up in South Sioux City it's not producing nuts but it's but it's you know it's hardy enough to grow there and it's a nice big shade tree that, that doesn't get planted very much so 
there are some of those oddballs out there that we need to be trying a bit more. Jeff had a question. Um, he was wondering if you know of any cities that might have an ordinance against those soil drenches. Um, I don't. Uh, and again, it gets so squirrely with a, an acre being occupied by multiple homeowners and those people not coordinating their insecticide treatments. And it's anybody's guess uh, whether we're exceed exceeding those thresholds or who, you know, who would you even hold accountable if, if you had the, the last person that treated, you know, that's not very fair to one person. And, you know, it gives an advantage to others that are treating early and incentivizes things that way. So I don't know of any ordinances along those ways. That does remind me, uh, I would be remiss not to mention that uh, at Nebraska Forest Service, we are putting together an EAB readiness plan template. Um, it's still in the stages of being fine-tuned before we release it to communities, but it's basically a fillable form that will give you a master plan that you go through and give the specifics on what your community is going to do on different issues related to EAB, and you end up with a readiness plan on the back end of it. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll probably be reaching out to the registrant email list late down the road as we're looking for communities to give that a try. We have some questions about Manchurian ash. Uh, um, yeah. Any experience or is there any um, benefit to that ash? Yeah, a as the name implies, it is an Asian species that is better adapted to EAB and more one that you're gonna see EAB in only if it's probably stressed significantly. Um, and I believe there, there are two or three named cultivars of Manchurian ash that are already in the nursery trade and available at certain nurseries. These are the kind of species that we're gonna see the industry starting to hybridize with our North American species to come up with new introductions that might be resistant or, or tolerant. And resistant and tolerant are two different things. That's a distinction that's important to make. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, it takes decades for a nursery to cross trees with each other, grow that seed in large blocks, and observe how it responds to EAB, and feel comfortable with making a release that they're staking their, their reputation on. So don't look for any new releases of ash anytime soon. Uh, but eventually we will be able to plant ash in our communities again, would be my guess. And uh, one quick question. Are there any, for lack of a better term, survivor trees? Um, trees that have survived after EAB has gone through? Yeah, you know, and, and that's, that's, that's where evolution and genetics really give us the, the resilience to, have, to find individuals that have just the right combination, a genetic twist of fate, that makes it uh, predisposed to tolerate EAB in ways that there was no selection for. There, there, what, there, there was an EAB choosing this gene amongst trees that survive, uh, but it's still, you know, a, a lottery ticket that some trees actually pull. There was a, a story I read recently about a, a tree block in Pennsylvania, I believe, where a gentleman had collected seed sources from dozens of states around the United States of different ash species and planted those out in blocks. And that became a very valuable learning tool as EAB moved through that area to observe and identify individual trees that had those genetics. And so that's another possibility in the, in the industry that they'll be looking to for new ash introductions down the road. And another reason why we'll never probably see ash or EAB go away in large areas. So we have, I believe we're caught up on the questions in the chat pod. If you still have questions, feel free to enter them in the chat pod. That way we can go ahead and get those questions answered. We've got a, a few minutes yet before we're just gonna cut off the program at eight o'clock, but it, you still have a little bit of time to get some questions answered. Yeah, and while you're looking there, I will say, I, I love working with tree boards. Tree City USA is a wonderful program and Nebraska has a, as the home of Arbor Day and the Arbor Day Foundation that, that curates that program. We have a strong tradition of uh, Tree City USA. If your community is not part of that program, you can reach out to me about getting involved. It's a pretty simple process without a lot of stringent requirements. It's mostly about 
identifying that you're a community that loves and celebrates and manages your trees. And uh, it's a great program and a great way for me to stay connected with communities. Uh, but outside of Tree City USA itself, if you're, if you're on a tree board of some sort or not, um, I definitely love working with, with those sort of groups. So Karen has a very uh, valid question. She wants to know if there's somebody that can come out and take a look at your trees to um, diagnose. So um, state agencies are really mostly putting resources into following up on EA, potential EAB fines outside of the existing counties that we founded in. So if you're in the Omaha metro area, I get calls all the time about somebody wanting to know whether their tree has EAB. We're, we're, we're not putting time and resources into, into looking for where it is in, air, in counties that we already know it exists. So we're trying to focus our resources on those new county fines. But yeah, you could certainly follow up with any of the agencies here uh, or myself if you believe you might have uh, EAB in an area and we can come help kind of determine what, where, whether that's the case. Um, and we usually try to work within a reasonable time frame. But again, in light of COVID-19 and, and not being able to do hotel stays and having a pretty big state, uh, you, depending on where you are, you might be, need to be more patient with this uh, before we're able to get to your community. And we work in partnership with Extension, uh, the Department of Agriculture and USDA APHIS to figure out whether somebody's more available than somebody else to go do that, that check. Yep, Karen, depending on where you're at in the, in the state, there might be a horticulture or community environment educator or somebody that might be able to look at trees, um, you know, reach out and we'd be happy to see if there's somebody that can look at your trees. They might not be able to diagnose EAB mm -hmm. officially, right? but um, give you some of the symptoms. Jody asked if there is a, the, do you know if there are oh geez, statements in housing contracts about houses being sold or purchased mm -hmm. that have ash trees, sort of like termite treatments or past infestations? Yeah, I, I've been needing to confirm this because I don't know whether that's there's a state statute about it. Um, but it's very easy for me to, to see there being, uh, you know, some disclosure uh, about that sort of thing in the in the real estate uh, industry. So. If anybody else has that answer, please chime in. Um, I, I've heard word of that, but I haven't confirmed that that's the case or whether it's it's happening at the city level or at the state level um, in terms of disclosing that you have an ash tree, there's an ash tree on this property that you're considering purchasing and here's the implications. So I don't have a definite answer, but I've heard whispering about it or rumors about it and have not confirmed those yet. Say, hey, Graham. Yeah. Um, this is John. Um, yeah. I get the answer to that uh, from my experience when uh, Jonathan Larson and I spoke to a real estate group who were seeking continuing education credits was it kind of depends. <laughs> and it depends on how um, the closing goes. Because that's when those, uh, those types of things are disclosed. Yeah, okay. And it depends on how close the contract is scrutinized and um, how much time they take. Anyone who's ever purchased a home knows that you generally look through about a, an inch and a half thick uh, sheath of documents. So it just kind of depends. If you look at the, the way it's written, it's, uh, are you aware of any uh, known uh, wood destroying insects or threat to, um, you know, threat to the well-being of the property? And so that sort of depends if it's growing a long ways away and even if it had EAB, could it fall, once it becomes brittle, could it fall on the house? And the answer is no, well then it's less likely to be raised up as a concern. Um, you know, it's, it's really tricky. The other thing is that most home inspectors are really good at uh, inspecting for, um, you know, the HVAC system and looking at the roof and, those types of things and are really not versed at all in looking at the landscape. You mean they're not trained so, horticulturists? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no, they're not. Um, but they're really good, you know, at, at the physical structure itself. 
and yeah. de you know detecting those kinds of uh, uh, imminent threats to uh, the light you know the the structural defects that might be in the house. Yeah. So it, it's not likely, but it is possible. I guess is the answer I would give. Yeah, we all have our expertise, right? And that's that's part of the challenge with EAB is you know it's a complicated, busy world we live in, and we all have a lot of time demands and none of us have the time to know everything we need to know about everything. And this is a really complicated topic to try to get the general public's head around. You can get the broad strokes out pretty easy, but the specifics, you know, are, are usually falling by the wayside sometimes. And so it's a challenging outreach effort, but I think we've made some really good strides between extension, the university, the forest service. Um, we're getting the word out pretty good, but there's, as you guys know, there, there's always more work to be done on outreach. We had one more question in the chat pod or two after that. I think we're going to start wrapping things up. So uh, Mike is in Kearney, but he was asking for homeowners or towns with smaller budgets. Is there tree grants or low cost replacement trees available through Forest Service, Arboretum, any of those agencies like that? Uh, we, we've had we've had. Uh, partners in uh, the legislature for a number of years trying to help us pass an, e an EAB Recovery Act. And that would, that would provide the Nebraska Forest Service pass-through dollars that could go to communities for, uh, you know, helping mitigate those costs for removals. But at this time, we don't have any funds at all that can be, that can go towards removal costs. We, we you know, perennia perennially, year in and year out, we're pretty good about having grant funding for planting projects. And it's worth mentioning that that's a piece of all this that's often falling by the wayside as well, that there is a lot of canopy loss that we need to replace. We can't be okay with just losing a bunch of trees and then just uh, being sad about it. We have to vigilantly and slowly and incrementally be replacing that, that canopy that either we're going to lose or have already lost as well. And so with all the costs to removal, um, we're, you know, we're always worried about the plant, the replanting message getting lost in the shuffle. Uh, but currently we don't have any funds. Uh, if, if you, you know, get a hold of your legislators, uh, let them know you support EAB Recovery Act. I don't think it's in, uh, you know, we're not in session right now anyways, but uh, there have been two or three attempts that I can remember to try to get that legislation passed. And that would give us the tools to give those pass through dollars to communities for that sort of effort. Sorry, Mike. And our final question, without climbing into the canopy, would inspecting a fallen branch be a worthwhile method of inspection? Um, if so, what approximate size branch would be worth inspecting? Um, yeah, again, Branch size, my, my entomology cohorts could answer better. I think, you know, EAB really doesn't want to tunnel through a teeny little twig. It's going to want a fairly significant size branch, you know, three, four inch or so at least would be my guess before you're going to see galleries. Uh, there are uh, bark knives that are a two-handled blade that you saw in some previous pictures that are used to sort of uh, gently pull the, the, the top layers away slowly so you're not cutting straight through and getting underneath the larvae or the, the, uh, the tunnels so that you can find those and potentially find uh, the larvae inside them as well. But by, by June, it's not very likely that you're going to see larvae inside those galleries any longer for that year. But um, yeah, you can certainly, and, and those, that's called a bark delimitation survey, and, and those are done in some areas in or, where they really want to know exactly where it is, and they sample branches that are cut down from ash trees in different areas. All right, with that, I uh, believe that, oh, Kate says generally colonize branches larger than 1.2 inches. That's very okay. specific. That's a little small. That's smaller than I would have guessed. That's good to know. What if it's 1.1? Does it not? Yes. Yeah, oh, that's too small. It gets out its measuring tape and. <laughs> well, so it's been that, great. Thank you, Graham, for coming and helping present. Thanks to all the extension professionals that were on to help answer questions. Um, 
we will make this recording available um, to the email listserv as uh, we get everything finalized. So thanks for joining us all tonight. Yeah, thanks everybody.